Hi everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm doing really good. I'm coming up to five years clean now in uh, the end of December. So life's going really well. And I'm just uh, still seeking the Lord a lot, doing a lot of studying and everything. And I just wanted to take a minute just to um, share just one of my favorite videos with you guys. Um, I'll just briefly kind of explain the video and then we can get into it. I'll probably just do like a screen share where we just play it. But I just think this video is so important and kind of missing in the body of Christ here. It just, um, it just deals with the uh, topic of salvation and basically like did Jesus and Paul teach opposite messages of salvation? And uh, so it's just, it's really good. This is uh, by one of my favorite teachers, uh, David Berceau. I mentioned him a little bit in the video I put out on baptism, but uh, he just, I thought about kind of just um, re-explaining this to you guys, but he just does such a good job. I thought we'd just play it, but uh, he kind of just, if the title of this video is called How Do We Harmonize Paul and James? But basically what it does is it, it takes a, a look at the, the, the uh, kind of coming from the early Christian standpoint of, of uh, the first 300 years of the church. When I say the early Christians, the first 300 years of the church, um, we can go back to their writings and kind of look at how they viewed scripture. So it's, um, it's not inspired, but it's very useful. And uh, basically, just for me studying the early Christians the last couple of years, this has like greatly um, just enriched my faith and um, just really helped me to understand my Bible better and understand Paul better because like, I'll just keep this real brief, but um, there's one warning we have in Scripture, not that it's war a warning not to listen to him, but it, there is a warning about in, in Peter about... Uh, Paul's writings that uh, people twist them to their destruction and that they can be confusing and hard to understand. Doesn't mean they're not, you know, they're not true. Yes, I love Paul's writings. They are inspired, they are sacred. But the point being is um, basically we have a problem in the American church today where basically um, you start going to church and right away you start learning Paul. That's the first thing they show you. Like the Romans road to salvation, different at you know Galatians there's different books of Paul at first you get Paul down and then you look at the other verses of the Bible but what ends up happening many times is if you go to Paul first before you go to Jesus you're going to end up ignoring many of the teachings of Jesus to go with Paul and so basically what's so good about this video he takes a look he starts with the teachings of Jesus shows you them then goes to uh, Jesus's three closest apostles shows you them and then we look at Paul and it all comes together beautifully and it's just I feel like if you miss this you're gonna misunderstand a big por portion of your Bible and just the gospel in general so yeah I just thought it'd be cool if you guys want to hang out and watch this I'm just gonna kind of press play on my computer it's a two-hour video but it is definitely worth watching it and uh, yeah just hope you guys enjoy the video take care hi I'm David Bursow, and for the next two nights, we're going to be talking about how to harmonize Paul and James. To this end, I'd like to read to you two completely true, infallible statements from Scripture. The first one says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's James 2, verses 21 through 24. But now let me read to you this other passage from Paul. If Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That's from Romans 4, verses 2 through 5. Well, certainly at first glance, those two passages seem to be in direct contradiction with each other. In fact, both writers quote the same passage from Genesis 
Yet they seem to be trying to prove exactly opposite things from that. Now, I realize that most evangelical Protestant Christians don't struggle with this seeming contradiction, and that's because all of their commentaries, study Bible notes, and other literature simply explain James away. By the time they get through with James, they've basically canceled out everything that he says. But I assume that you, who are listening to me tonight, are different. You're not comfortable just ignoring the clear, plain statements that James wrote under inspiration. You're wanting to know the real truth about the matter. And the truth is that this is no small issue. I'm not exaggerating in saying that much of the essence of Christianity is intrinsically involved in how we harmonize Paul and James, because it boils down to the issue of the gospel of Jesus versus the gospel of man. And sadly, most of us are so intimidated by the huge mass of commentary, study Bibles, Sunday school materials, and other books out there that we're afraid of standing up for the gospel of Jesus. Because if we dare to believe what Jesus taught and to speak out about it, we know that evangelical Protestants will call us heretics. They'll say that obviously we aren't saved. They'll say that we're preaching a work salvation, that we're trusting in our own righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ. In fact, even if you attend a conservative Anabaptist church, you might well face those same accusations if you try to preach the gospel of Jesus. Well, if those things intimidate you now, I hope by the end of tomorrow night they no longer will. Because those of us who dare to believe the gospel that Jesus preached don't need to apologize to anyone or hide in corners off by ourselves. We have the firm witness of the New Testament. I don't mean just a handful of verses here and there, but the New Testament taken as a whole. And we have the undeniable record of history that the gospel that was handed down to the church by the apostles was the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel that Martin Luther preached or the gospel of evangelical Protestantism. I'm sure it would come as a surprise to most professing Bible-believing Christians today that throughout most of the history of Christianity, practically nobody thought there was any contradiction between Paul and James. Practically speaking, the issue didn't really exist until Martin Luther came on the scene. He created the contradiction by taking New Testament Christianity, which the Catholic Church had severely twisted one way, and then he gave it a whole nother twist the other way. The result was Christendom was like a giant pretzel. And kingdom groups, like the Anabaptists, stood at the crossroads between the two halves of this giant pretzel. There were several corrupt methodologies that Luther Calvin, and the other Protestant Reformation leaders followed. Now, in this respect, they were merely carrying on the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, which had followed these same methodologies for centuries. In fact, these are all basically the methodologies that the Gnostics had invented back in the first and second century. Okay, what were these corrupt methodologies I'm talking about? Well, there are four major ones. Number one, and perhaps the most important, is relegating the teachings of Jesus to the back closet, that Jesus didn't really teach the theology of Christianity, that we have to go to Paul to get that, okay? So shoving Jesus in the back closet, that's the first one. The second one, which is nearly as bad, is proof texting, now, what we mean by proof texting is to establish a theological position by picking and choosing verses from the New Testament or from the Old that fit this particular theology that you want to promote and ignoring a bunch of other verses that don't fit that. Now, we're all so used to this, we think that's 
a normal way of life. I mean, that's what I knew growing up as a boy. The Bible was, to me, a collection of proof texts. And it's been that way most of my life. It wasn't until I read the early Christian writings that I realized that you've got to read the whole thing. You've got to take the whole New Testament. And the model you come up with to explain any particular position needs to be able to fit all the verses rather than fitting some of them and the rest of them being shoved under the rug. Number three, the first one was relegating Jesus to the back closet. The second was proof texting. Number three, turning the writers of the New Testament into theologians, which they were not, and changing the ordinary, everyday words that they used into specialized theological terms. Again, we're so used to hearing things presented that way, we think that that is normal. Okay, and the last one of these corrupt methodologies, number four, are dishonest Bible translations and reference works. And what we have to be on guard is to recognize that even though the Bible is the inspired Word of God, translations are made by imperfect humans who have their preconceptions and their positions to maintain. And so our Greek lexicons and Bible commentaries, Bible dictionaries, all of the reference works that we use. Now, it's because of these corrupt methodologies that Christians today imagine that there's an apparent contradiction between James and Paul. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the need to start with Jesus. Christianity is the only religion or even philosophy I know of where so many of the professing adherents of this religion or philosophy generally ignore the teachings of the founder and go instead to the teachings of one of the disciples of the founder. I say that because the simple truth is most people who profess to be Bible-believing Christians today go to Paul to explain what Jesus supposedly taught about salvation. And again, to my knowledge, nobody ever thought of doing such a thing before Martin Luther, except, that is, for the Gnostics and, to some degree, Augustine. This would be like someone going to a Jewish rabbi, let's say before the time of Jesus, and saying, I'm convinced that you Jews worship the one true God, and I would like to become a Jew. Who is your foremost teacher? And they would, the rabbis would say, well, Moses is. And so this person says, well, I would like to know more about what this Moses taught. Can you give me something to read? And then imagine the rabbi saying, yes, we've got a scroll here, and handing him the scroll of Joshua or Judges or the scroll of Ezra. Well, of course they wouldn't do that. They would hand him one of the scrolls of Moses, Deuteronomy or Exodus or, or one of the other books of the Pentateuch. Or it'd be like a student going to a philosophy professor and saying, I'd like to know what Plato taught. What book should I read to get to know the thoughts and teachings of Plato? And the professor, instead of directing you to one of the writings of Plato, like the Republic, he suggests you begin by reading Aristotle who was a student of Plato. Well, this is essentially what Luther did, and practically all Protestants have followed in Luther's footsteps, although normally they are totally unaware of why they're taking this approach. It's just the approach that was presented to them when they first became a Christian. When Luther translated the Bible into German, he stuck a preface in front of each of the New Testament books and an overall preface before the whole New Testament, so that anyone who would be reading the New Testament would get flavored by his vision. They would be reading it through his eyeglasses, so to speak, before they actually got to the text of Scripture. And this is what he wrote in his preface to the book of Romans. He said, This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel and is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. 
Therefore, it appears that St. Paul wanted to comprise briefly in this one epistle the whole Christian and evangelical doctrine. Well, he goes on to say a whole lot more. In fact, his preface to the book of Romans is about half the length of the epistle itself. Let me read to you some excerpts from his preface to the New Testament. Luther writes, From all this you can now judge all the books and decide among them which are the best. See, Luther didn't put them all on the same level. He said some of the books of the New Testament are more important than others. He writes, John's Gospel and St. Paul's Epistles, especially that to the Romans, and St. Peter's first epistle are the true kernel and marrow of all the books. They ought rightly to be the first books, and it would be advisable for every Christian to read them first and most. John's gospel is the one tender, true, chief gospel, far, far to be preferred to the other three and placed high above them. So too the epistles of St. Paul and St. Peter far surpass the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In a word, this is still Luther, St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and good for you to know, even though you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. Therefore, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to them, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it, end quote. Now, why did Martin Luther shove Matthew, Mark, and Luke to the back burner while praising the gospel of John? Well, for one thing, neither the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain are recorded in John. And, of course, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount directly contradicts Luther's gospel. Furthermore, Matthew uses the Greek verb to believe, pestuo, only ten times. Mark likewise uses it only ten times, and Luke only uses the verb nine times. What about John? Oh, he uses it ninety-nine times. So see, Luther's gospel of easy believism, just believe that Jesus died for your sins and that you can do nothing good and you will be saved because you believe that, That's why he liked those books. And you may say, well, yeah, but we don't follow that kind of thing. Oh, yes, you do. You stop and think about what books are given the most prominence by Protestant evangelical printing houses. Isn't Romans the one? You've heard the expression, the Romans road to salvation. You've seen tracts put out by Campus Crusade and that sort of thing. Invariably, they take you to Romans. Or they'll take some verses out of the Gospel of John. Sometimes missionaries or evangelists will hand out little booklets that have part of the New Testament. And what part do they usually hand out? It's usually John, and if not that, Romans. There are exceptions. I've known ones who've handed out Luke, but generally it's John or Romans. We do that because Luther is the one who started that, and we follow in his footsteps, even though most evangelical Protestants have never read a single word of Luther. Actually, what Luther did was a direct violation of Jesus' teaching at Matthew 23, 9 and 10, where he said, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Now, we usually apply that only to the situation of calling our minister Father John or something like that, which is a correct application. But Jesus means a lot more than that. We shouldn't elevate any human to the status of teacher or theologian that somehow he eclipses Jesus Christ or that we make Jesus Christ fit him instead of making him fit Jesus Christ. But that's exactly what Luther did. He set Paul up as the great theologian and his letter to the Romans as the heart of the gospel. According to Luther, Paul was the primary teacher we go to in order to learn the gospel of Christianity instead of going to Jesus. And that's still the general practice today. In fact, Luther was so audacious 
as to say that we can know everything we need to know about Christ and the gospel without ever having heard or read the Sermon on the Mount or the rest of what Jesus said that's not recorded in John. Now, the early Christians took a bold stand against that kind of nonsense when the Gnostics tried to do something similar, and the original Anabaptist took an equally bold stand against Luther when he tried that nonsense. Today, I'm afraid, though, that most Anabaptists don't. Probably without realizing it, they're essentially saying that the original Anabaptists actually were heretics. Today's Anabaptists are basically saying that Luther and Zwingli and Calvin were the ones who correctly understood and taught the gospel of salvation. That indeed Paul is the great Christian teacher, not Jesus. They don't use those words, of course, but that's the result of their methodologies. But I'm not just speaking to Anabaptists. Many of you come from evangelical or non-denominational backgrounds And very likely, a lot of you have had so much of Luther's teachings crammed down your throats that you found it difficult to stand up for the gospel that Jesus preached. Now, the rest of this evening, we probably won't be mentioning Paul or James again, even though the title of this topic is Harmonizing Paul and James. That's because I want to demonstrate to you how you should examine the scriptures on any topic. So what we're going to be doing is walking together tonight and tomorrow night, looking at the totality of what the New Testament teaches on salvation, beginning with what our Master Jesus Christ taught. Now, time's not going to permit us to read every verse of the New Testament that pertains in some way to salvation, or even most of them. But that's really what you need to do. So that's why we're including a third CD with this set. The third CD is not something you can listen to, so don't put it in your CD player. Instead, insert it into your computer. It should start playing on its own. If it doesn't, just go to Windows Explorer, find the disk on the directory there, and double-click on the file that's entitled Paul-James. And this third disk, that file when you open it, contains all or virtually all of the scriptures in the New Testament pertaining to salvation. And I really encourage you to take the time to read all of those New Testament passages, and if at all possible, read them at one sitting, that is, all in one evening or all in one Saturday afternoon, So you can get a feel for the totality of what the New Testament teaches on the subject of salvation instead of this piecemeal verse here, verse there sort of feeling. Now, when we get to the end tomorrow night, I think you'll agree with me that there's no conflict between Paul and James and that they both taught the same gospel as Jesus Christ. So let's begin by taking a look at the gospel of Jesus. In the four Gospels, there are several long passages in which Jesus explains the things we need to know about salvation, that we need to know about being a Christian, alongside a hundred or more shorter passages, and all of these together help us to fully grasp his doctrine of salvation. Now, one of the longest passages in which he discusses The essence of salvation, the essence of Christianity, is John chapters 14 through 17. So even Martin Luther would approve of us using these chapters. These chapters are particularly important because this was Jesus' last time to talk at length with his apostles before he would be arrested and crucified. And I'm not going to read the whole section there, John 14 through 17, although I would certainly encourage you to do so. But let me read to you the middle section of that, John chapter 15. We'll read the first 19 verses, John 15, 1 through 9. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name he may give to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Let's meditate a moment on that passage. Here are some of the key things I noted. Number one, that Jesus describes an ongoing life relationship. Our life being tied into his life. Our spiritual existence and our power come from him through this relationship. We can do nothing apart from Christ. Now, something else I gather from this passage, and I'm sure you have too, is that we must bear godly fruit or we're going to be pruned off of the vine. He made that crystal clear. And then he said, we abide in Christ's love only if we obey his commandments. But he's not our taskmaster. He's our friend and a loving, gentle master. Finally, a third point that I noted was, if we abide in Christ, we will be separate from the world. Now, I've heard literally hundreds of presentations of the gospel message of salvation from various preachers and evangelists. And you know, I've never heard even one of them read this passage of Jesus as part of their message on salvation. I've never heard one of them use this illustration that Jesus used about being branches on a vine. Well, how might we sum up what Jesus said in that passage that we've just read? To me, the best way to sum it up is that Jesus tells us that in order to be saved— We must maintain an obedient love-faith relationship with him. An obedient love-faith relationship. I remember that concept from the the four letters, O-L-F-R, obedient love-faith relationship, and think about only left from right. To be saved, just know only left from right. Obedient love-faith relationship. Now, let's look at some of the more common alternate systems that humans have put forward. Actually, all of the doctrines and systems of salvation that have ever existed in the Christian faith can be categorized into two groups. You can divide them all off into two sections. And what are those two groups? Well, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, work salvation and salvation by faith. 
Well, that's because we've all been trained to think that way. But the answer that I would give is this. There are two kinds. The first one would be a system that requires an obedient love-faith relationship with Christ. And the second kind is everything else. Anything else anybody puts forward as a way to be saved that does not require an obedient love-faith relationship with Jesus Christ, they can be all lumped together because they're all just as useless. Let's look at what some of these have been. Paul in his day had to fight against Christo-Judaism. That was basically a system of believing that Jesus is the Messiah and Savior and that he's even the Son of God. But also, you have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Well, no, that's not Christianity. It's this obedient love relationship with Christ. It's not going back to the Mosaic law. The system the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, and all of them have put forward is what I would call sacramentalism. Basically, receive the sacraments through the church, attend Mass regularly, don't die in unconfessed mortal sin, and be a loyal member of the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, and you're saved. A third system you might call meritism. That is, live dutifully by all of the commandments in the New Testament, and you'll be saved. You don't have to have a love relationship with Christ. That would be essentially creating a second Mosaic law. But now, instead of it being the laws of Moses, it's the laws of Jesus. Just keep these laws, and through that merit, you'll be saved. No, that doesn't work either. I'll use another one. I'm making up a lot of words here. Goodism. Just attend church and be a good person, and you'll be saved. That's what nearly all liberals believe. It's probably what most Catholics believe as well. Old orderism. Now, this would be something pertinent to Mennonites, Amish. And by that, the system of believe the basic doctrines of that old order of church you belong to, remain in it all of your life, and conform at least outwardly to its standards, many of which are New Testament commandments, and you'll be saved. A love relationship with Christ is not required. The last system, the most common that we all run into is evangelical Protestantism. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and have a born-again experience. Believe that you are saved by faith or grace alone and that obedience is not necessary for salvation. If you believe that obedience is essential for salvation, you're teaching unsound doctrine and you're probably not even saved. Well, see, all of those you can lump together because none of them require an obedient, love-faith relationship with Jesus Christ. I realize that evangelicals talk a whole lot about a relationship with Christ, but they imagine that they can have a love relationship with Him without being obedient to Him. Now, let me explain something right now, though, and it's to say this. There are thousands and thousands of Christians who belong to various churches who would hold to one of those man-made systems that I've talked about, that their church would teach that. And yet, that particular individual does have a genuine, obedient, love-faith relationship with Christ. I've met many, many evangelicals who have such a relationship. I've met people in the old orders of the Amish and the Mennonites who have that relationship. Reading the works of various Catholics through history, it seems fairly obvious that those particular people had such an obedient love-faith relationship. In short, having the right answer isn't what's going to save you. It's actually having the relationship that saves you. So you can say, well, this is how we're saved, and it'd be totally wrong, but you really are saved because you're abiding in Jesus Christ. You have this obedient love-faith relationship. That's what counts. Now, of course, we don't want to spread wrong teaching that would then stumble other people and cost them their eternal life. Well, in objection to this teaching of an obedient love-faith relationship, someone once asked me, well, David, if obedience is necessary for salvation, I want you to tell me how much obedience is, is necessary, because obviously nobody is 100% obedient. 
Well, he really thought he had me stumped on that because I couldn't say, oh, well, it's uh, 75% or it's 65 or or something. But I just brushed it off because he was using a fallacious form of argumentation known as the fallacy of the beard. Let me ask you a question. How many whiskers does it take to make up a beard? One? If I have one whisker on my cheek, would you say I have a beard? No, I don't think so. What about two? No. Would three be enough? Four. Well, see, we could keep going, and there is no spot where you could say, ah, yeah, 67 doesn't constitute a beard, but once you go to 68, yeah, now you have a beard. No, there, there is no magic line there. And yet the truth is some people don't have beards, and some do. You can't define it, though, down to a specific number of hairs or to a specific length that the hair has to be on a man's cheek and chin. You see, not everything in life and not everything in Christianity, in fact, not most things in Christianity, can be reduced to a formula. Now, some things can be reduced to a formula. Like, you know, how do you make water? Well, it's two parts of hydrogen, one part of oxygen, H2O. Or at what temperature does water boil at sea level? Those things, yes, you can give an exact definition. But there are many things in life. No, there's no exact definition. What constitutes long? What constitutes short? What constitutes cold? What constitutes hot? Can you name a specific degree that it's cold if it's 49 degrees, but it's not cold if it's 50? Or it's hot if it's 90, but it's not hot if it's 89. See, so many things don't lend themselves to drawing a magic line, and yet they are just as real as things that can be defined precisely. And relationships cannot be ever reduced to a formula. And according to Jesus Christ, what we've just read there, salvation is acquired through a relationship, not through a formula. It's abiding in Jesus Christ, in his love. All right, let's analyze this obedient love-faith relationship a bit that he just described. As we said, Jesus likens the relationship to our being a branch on his vine. Now, when he talks about a vine, he probably had in mind a grapevine, not a watermelon or squash vine or something like that. Now, just like a branch in a grapevine or any other vine, really, cannot produce fruit. It cannot even live unless it's attached to the stalk that's coming out of the ground. Likewise, as he said, we can do nothing without his power. That is nothing that's going to be lasting, that's going to be right and eternal. We are dependent upon him. Our eternal life comes through this relationship with him. We cannot save ourselves. But secondly, very importantly, he shows that salvation is not a one-time event. We are saved by maintaining a continuing love-faith relationship with Jesus. We have to abide with Christ on this vine. And what is required to abide in his love on the vine? He said it's keeping his commandments. So, We are totally dependent on him, and yet we play a vital role in our salvation because if we do not keep his commandments, then we don't love him. And if we don't love him, we don't abide on the vine. We've broken the relationship. But as we've mentioned, this isn't a harsh taskmaster-slave relationship. It's a joyful love relationship. In fact, he even calls us friends. Something else we should note, he chose us, not vice versa. We didn't attach ourselves to his vine. He put us there. Furthermore, it's a matter of God having first loved us before we loved him. And a final point, if we are abiding on this vine, he makes it clear that we will be different from the world and the world will hate us. Uh, That doesn't mean that every single person in the world is going to hate us. He didn't say that. 
But the world will always be at odds with God's people. What we stand for, it hates. Now, there are several things I think we can deduce from this explanation that Jesus has given us. One of the things is that there are past, present, and future aspects of salvation. Now, please don't say, I have been saved from the penalty of sin, I am being saved from the power of sin, and I will be saved from the presence of sin. I know that's what the seminaries teach, but the New Testament says no such thing. And Jesus says absolutely nothing about that. In fact, that totally contradicts what he did say. But the past aspect that he reveals is that somehow, at some point in time, we became attached to this vine. Maybe a better way to say it is a new shoot was birthed out of that vine. That was us. We began this salvation relationship with Christ. So there was a past aspect of our salvation, a time that we can say we were saved and are now living on this vine. But there's a present aspect as well. Right now, if we're walking in the Spirit, we are abiding in Jesus on this vine. This is a present aspect of salvation. It's a breathing living, ongoing thing. It's just like a branch on a tree that has a constant inflow of life-giving water and nutrients drawn in from the roots of the tree. If you cut a branch off of a tree or a vine, it will normally die within a matter of days or sometimes hours. But what's the future aspect? Well, if we don't produce fruit throughout our lives, Jesus says we're going to be cut off of the vine and thrown in the fire. So just because we're on the vine right now doesn't mean we're still going to be on the vine next year or the year after that. So to say that the past aspect is that we've been saved from the penalty of sin, that contradicts Jesus. He said, no, if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut off and thrown in the fire. So the penalty of sin is still there. But it's a good illustration of what I call emperor's new clothes theology. I think we all know the children's story about the emperor's new clothes. These shrewd con men managed to convince the emperor that they had this special, wonderful cloth that was invisible to anybody who didn't deserve to hold the post that he was holding. Well, as the story goes, everyone pretends that they see this cloth because They don't want to be shown to be incompetent and not worthy of their post. Now, in theology, it usually works in reverse. That is, we all pretend we can't see the emperor's clothes even when he plainly has them on. In other words, we develop selective blindness, pretending the Bible doesn't say the things that any sixth-grade child could see that it plainly does say, just like in the story of the emperor's new clothes. It was finally a little boy who said, well, he's not wearing any clothes. That's why so often the truth of Christianity is hidden from the wise and intellectual, as Jesus said, revealed to babes, because it's right there. It takes somebody more learned to come up with all of these reasons of how to explain away what it just clearly says. A good example is what we mentioned here about Jesus' words that if we don't bear fruit, the Father will cut us off of the vine, and then we'll be cast into the fire and burned up. Now, it doesn't take a lot of intellect to be able to see that, therefore, there is no such thing as unconditional eternal security, that once you're on this vine, you're on it to stay. Because he just said, no, it's not that way, and he spent quite a bit of time giving warning of what we must do to abide on it, and that is to keep his commandments. And so that's what all the seminaries teach, right, and all of the learned commentaries and all that. No, it's, it's the emperor's new clothes. It's like, did you see that passage in John? No, I didn't see it. Did you? No, uh-uh, I didn't, I didn't see it. No, there's nothing in there about getting cut off a vine. No, I didn't see it. And that's what you have back back and forth, everyone playing this, this game, as if somehow that's going to change the laws of eternity. And here Jesus takes the time to tell us how it's all going to work, and we develop this blindness where we refuse to see what he's told us. Okay, we've talked about the first problem that I enumerated earlier, and that was of pushing Jesus' teachings to the back closet. 
like what people have done to this passage in John. You, you hardly ever hear it preached on. Now, let me say a few more words about that second corrupt methodology, and that's proof texting. You know, I can produce a proof text for every single one of those formulas that I read to you earlier, these various methods man have, has come up with to get saved outside of an obedient love relationship with Christ. Like I say, there's at least one verse for every one of those, and probably I could come up with quite a few verses. And there's proof text for formulas we didn't even talk about, like universal salvation. I, I can think of three or four passages in Scripture that would seem to support that. Well, what's the alternative to proof texting? It's you take everything the New Testament says on a subject, and you give full weight to every verse. You don't just take it all and then say, well, now what Paul says, that's above everything else, and everything else has to be made to fit that. No, you give equal weight to everything. You don't shove anything in the closet. Now, you start with Jesus Christ, and you read his disciples in the light of what he has taught. If there's any seeming contradiction, you never make Jesus' statement subservient to something that Paul or Peter would say. It would be the other way around. But normally, that issue isn't there because they taught what their master had previously taught. And so if you're going to come up with a summary or model of any theological teaching such as salvation, it needs to fit everything the New Testament teaches. That is, it'll fit it without having to shove verse after verse into the corner. Well, sure, there may be occasionally a difficult verse that doesn't seem to fit in with the whole tenor of the rest of the New Testament, but it should be an unusual situation. Now, part of this total New Testament approach is realizing that every time Jesus or one of his disciples said something that concerns salvation, it doesn't mean that they were intending that their statement summarized everything that could be said on the subject. Not even the extended passage that we read there from John. It doesn't cover every single detail. I'll give you an illustration. Years ago in Texas, our family met a family who had moved to Tyler, Texas from Pennsylvania, and they were from Amish background. And I remember one day, the wife was telling my wife about shoe fly pie, which I'd never heard of before. And she told my wife, you make it using king syrup. That's a brand of syrup, K-I-N-G. Well, I walked away from the discussion thinking in my mind, that's what the whole pie was made of, except for the crust, just this king syrup. And so I was picturing something that would be extremely gooey, sickening sweet. I mean, it is a very sweet pie, but other things go into it other than king syrup. She wasn't meaning that was the only ingredient. And it's that way with so many passages of the Bible. What is said is true, but it doesn't mean that that's everything that can be said on the subject and that therefore you exclude things that add to that. The fact that that recipe for shoe fly pie includes king syrup doesn't exclude the fact that molasses also goes into it and flour and things like that. Now, my proposition tonight is that the passage we just read there at John 15, which teaches that we're saved through an obedient love-faith relationship with Jesus Christ, that it's a model or summary of what the New Testament teaches on salvation. Now, if I'm right, if this is truly the kernel of the gospel, as far as salvation, that is, we should find that nearly every passage we can come across in the New Testament supports this view, that it fits into this model of an obedient, love-faith relationship with Christ. There shouldn't be a whole list of problem verses that we're going to have to explain away. So let's begin by going through the rest of Jesus' teachings to see if this really is the kernel of the gospel. Does Jesus say other things that would make it clear that, no, this isn't really a summation of salvation? When we're through with Jesus, and only after we're through at looking at Jesus, then we'll look at the writing of his disciples. Now, to begin with, if we're going to take this John 15 passage as our model, and this is the first thing, let's say, that we've read in Scripture, there's some unanswered questions that we'll be looking for answers in other passages we read. 
Number one is, how do we get on this vine in the first place? How do we become a branch? Jesus doesn't explain it there. What is the fruit that we need to bear? He said several times, if we don't bear fruit, that will be cut off the vine. What fruit is it? He said, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. What are the commandments? The only one discussed in that passage is to love one another. Is that the only commandment that he gave? Well, these are things that we would expect the rest of the New Testament to clarify. If we start at the beginning of the New Testament, at the first chapter of Matthew and go forward, the first significant amount of teaching we get from Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with Matthew 5. Now, again, we're not going to have time to be able to read all of that, although I would really encourage you to do so. But here are just a few excerpts from it I'd like you to think about that relate to what Jesus said there about growing as a branch on his vine. Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, I had stated earlier that this idea that when we are born again, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. I didn't mean to imply that we are not saved from the penalty of our past sins, because our past sins are forgiven in the new birth. But forgiveness after that is on a daily basis. But even I think the forgiveness of our past sins is a conditional one because of what Jesus said here. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. And the illustration that he gave, the parable of the servant who had had his huge debt forgiven by the king, but when he went out and wouldn't forgive his fellow servant, then the king reinstated the debt that had been forgiven, so it was a conditional forgiveness. All right, let's go forward. Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Do you see the flexible living relationship that's that's here? Our forgiveness, the way we're going to be judged, is so dependent upon what we do. It's not an inflexible thing that was done. It's all finished. Christ's death is all finished, but as far now as having this relationship, it's an ongoing thing. And it's not an easy thing. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. A whole lot of people have found the gospel of easy believism, which alone pretty much disqualifies it as the narrow way that few will find. Again, he said, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Again, back to obedience. If we practice lawlessness, it doesn't matter how much we profess the degree of love we have for Jesus. He's going to say, I never knew you. Then he concludes the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, that's what he's just taught there, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." Now, please note that the obedience that is required is obedience to his teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. He makes it very clear there in those verses. And, of course, it would be obedience to other commandments that he gave in addition to those. But, you know, a lot of professing Christians today participate in this great, big, huge cop-out. And what is that? It's this. I get subjective feelings in my head. 
ah, this is Jesus giving me commandments, that he wants me to do something. So I imagine that I'm being obedient to him because I follow these subjective impressions in my mind when perhaps I'm living in total disobedience to his genuine commandments. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do believe that God gives us guidance. We wouldn't pray daily for his guidance and for the Holy Spirit to show us the way and help us make right decisions and all of those sorts of things. But he said that he and his Father would dwell with those who love him, who abide with him. And he made it clear, if you do my commandments, my Father will abide with you and I will abide with you. So if we're not keeping the commandments that he gave there in the scriptures, we shouldn't imagine that he's giving us new commandments. As he said, he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in what is great. He's not going to give us special personalized commandments when we can't even keep the ones that apply to everybody. I know of several instances of of people who've said God has told them to do something that is directly, directly opposed to what he has said in Scripture. So when Jesus talks about being obedient to his commandments, if we love him, he's talking about the ones given in Scripture. Let's be obedient to those. And then if we truly are following the commandments that apply to all Christians, yes, we can believe that he'll give us further directions and personalized instruction, but they'll never cancel out the laws of eternity that he's given us in the New Testament. All right, let's look at a few more. Matthew 10, verse 32, he says, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see the contingent relationship that this is? It's an ongoing relationship. We may at one time confess Jesus Christ, but later on in our life deny him, or we may deny him by the way we live. He says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is how great a commitment that he requires of us. This obedient love-faith relationship is something that has to take precedence over everything else and every other person in our life. At the same time, in Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, this is the love part of all of this. Jesus commands everything of us to even lay down our life for him. And yet his yoke is not heavy. When you read in the scriptures, in the book of Acts, and you read Paul's letters and the letters of the other apostles and disciples, it's obvious they were joyful. The yoke was easy, even though it meant enduring tremendous hardship. And every one of the apostles either suffered or laid down his life for Jesus Christ. And yet they all did it willingly and joyfully. I'm going to pick just a few more here for special comment. Luke 13, 69 says, He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. This relates, again, so directly to that illustration he gave of us being branches on the vine. It's nice to know that he gives us some time. If we don't bear fruit, he doesn't just, whoop, we're off the vine. He gives us time. Here he mentions three years. He would give up to four years, and I don't know that that is intended as a literal time measurement or not, but it's obvious it's not indefinite. At some point, we get cut off, but he doesn't do it hastily, and he will try to feed us. He will try to do things to help us to produce that fruit unless our carnal nature just blocks out his spirit. Luke 24, 46 through 47 Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
See, it was Jesus' plan from the beginning that his gospel would be preached to all nations. It's not something unique to Paul when he went to the Gentiles. Jesus had already talked about this to his apostles, that they were to go out and preach to all the nations. Now, just two more passages I'd like to read. John 3, verses 3 through 5 says, Jesus answered and said to him, talking to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, okay, now we learn there's this new birth that has to take place before we're going to be on a branch on that vine. I want to read John three fourteen through 21, a passage that will be very familiar to all of you, at least part of it will. He said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Well, that's usually about as far as most preachers ever go. They stop there, or maybe they stop just with John 3.16. Look, just believe in Jesus. No, he didn't come to condemn anyone. Just believe, and you won't even be judged or condemned. Well, let's hear the rest of it out. Verse 19, Jesus says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Ah, it does get back again to what we do, what we love, how we live. If we continue to practice evil, we're only kidding ourselves if we think that we believe in Jesus Christ. Because either we come to the light because we want to practice righteous deeds, or we continue practicing evil because we hate the light. And we can profess our love for Jesus from now to the end of our life, and it doesn't mean a thing. Before leaving John 3.16 in that passage in which it's contained, let's talk a moment about this word believe. There are two closely related Greek words that are often translated in English as believe. One is pistuo, which means to believe, to trust, to place confidence in. The other is patho, which is sometimes translated to believe, but other times is translated to obey. So in Greek, the concept of believing is closely related to the concept of obeying. It typically means more than just giving mental assent to something. Now, interestingly, did you know that the root of our English word to believe is to love. Now, my Webster's Dictionary gives two definitions for the word, the verb that is, believe. One is to suppose or think. The other is to have confidence in a statement or promise of another. Let me just quickly illustrate these two kinds of believing. The first one, that merely means to suppose or think, I can say, I believe the moon produces no light of its own. It only reflects the light of the sun. Now, this is what I was taught in school. I've never done any experiments to prove it, but I believe it. I suppose that's true. It requires no action on my part. There's no loss or reward to be figured. Now, the second kind of believing, to have confidence in a statement or promise of another does require some sort 
of action. There is a loss or reward that's usually involved. I'll give you an illustration. Suppose I live here in Pennsylvania and work as a lower-level manager for Johnson Industries, a large privately owned company. Walter Johnson is the owner of the company, and he lives and works in Colorado, where the company has its headquarters. As a result, I've never met Mr. Johnson. In fact, I've never even seen a picture of him. But one day out of the blue, a man walks to my office and says, Hi, I'm Walter Johnson. Well, at this point, the first kind of believing is sufficient. Okay, I believe you're Walter Johnson. Doesn't cost me anything one way or the other. But then he says, Even though you don't know it, I've been following your progress in the company for several years. And David, I'm aware of the quality of work you're turning out. In fact, I've decided to make you an officer of the company in two years and move you out to Colorado. When that happens, we're going to quadruple your salary and we're going to cut your work week back to 30 hours a week. Well, of course, at this point, my head is spinning. I'm hoping this really is Walter Johnson and not just some prankster. However, he then adds, listen, I'm going to be going overseas to Asia for the next two years, and I'm going to be out of touch. During that time, I want you to scrap the new warehouse project that's been started. And I reply, you mean you don't want me to continue to tear down our present warehouses in order to build bigger ones? He says, that's right. Okay, I say, well, are you going to tell my supervisor? Because he's going to be pretty upset if I do this on my own initiative. And to my surprise, Walter Johnson says, no, I'm not going to speak to your supervisor. If he asks you why you're scrapping the project, just tell him that I told you to do that. Yeah, I reply, but what if he doesn't believe me? He's going to fire me. Well, if he fires you, he'll have to answer to me when I return in two years. Meanwhile, I'm sure you and your family won't starve. You might end up cooking hamburgers at McDonald's, but you'll have enough food on the table and clothes to wear. And once I return, that'll all be of little consequence, won't it? You'll be reinstated with full back pay. On the other hand, if you don't scrap the project like I've ordered you to, when I come back, I am going to fire you, and that will be a permanent firing. Okay, now you see I'm in that second definition of believe, to have confidence in a statement or promise of another. It's easy to believe that the moon reflects the light of the sun. There's no consequence to me one way or the other. But to believe that this really is Walter Johnson and that he's going to do these things that he said, it's a very different kind of believing. When the Bible speaks of being saved by believing in Jesus Christ, it's talking about the second definition of believing, to have confidence in the statements or promise of another. If we believe in Jesus, then we believe him when he tells us that we, like a branch, will be cut off of his vine if we don't love him. And we believe him when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We also believe that despite the teachings of his that seem very difficult at first, that his yoke is actually light. We believe that his commandments are truly in our best interests. After all, nearly a third of the world believes in Jesus Christ in the first sense of the English word, that is, to suppose, to give mental assent to. They believe he's the Son of God, that he died for their sins. But if that's all that's required for salvation, then the way of Christianity is hardly a narrow way that few will find. We hardly have to strive to enter into the gate as Jesus said we should. And what he said in the Sermon on the Mount is not true about building on the rock by doing what he commanded in that sermon. So either we make Jesus a liar or we recognize that the kind of believing he talks about is the kind that is closely related to obeying, to have confidence in what someone tells you to do and therefore you act upon it. Before leaving Jesus and his teachings, let's talk for a few moments about Matthew 25. For most of my adult life, I've heard the Protestant evangelism question, if you were standing right now at the gates of heaven and I were Jesus, 
and I asked you, why should I let you in? What would you say? And of course, the person will probably say, well, because I've been a good person or I go to church regularly. And then the answer is no. Jesus says that all the good you've done is nothing but filthy rags. And you go on to explain that if you're going to get in heaven, you have to be trusting in him alone, that you have faith in his death and resurrection, his shed blood has cleansed you from sin, and you're not trusting at all in any actions or righteousness of your own. Ah, then he'll say, come right in, welcome to heaven. The irony is that Jesus himself, when he was here on the earth, talked about that very situation of facing whether we're going to inherit eternal life in heaven or eternal punishment in the lake of fire. And what did he say it would be based on? Did he say, oh, I'm going to ask you this question, why should I let you in heaven? No. He said that at the end, when he returns, he's going to gather all of the people before him. This is in the what's sometimes called the last judgment. And how is he going to separate them? By how they answer that question, why should I let you in heaven? No, he's going to tell them. The decision is already made, and he's going to tell them why they're going to inherit eternal life or be sent to eternal punishment. And he says, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was sick or in prison, and you visited me. I was naked, didn't have sufficient clothing, and you clothed me. And even though we didn't do it personally to him, to the extent we did it to the least of these, his brothers, he said, you've done it to me. So why do Protestants evangelize using this other fake scenario that Jesus is going to ask you these theological questions and if you better answer them right? And you better not at all have anything that you've done yourself to bring up just simply that you believed in him. When he himself, the judge, the one who's going to do this, has already told us in advance what he's going to be looking for. And it's not answers to theological questions. Now, if the Protestant evangelical view is correct, I would have to ask, what kind of Savior is this that we have? What kind of Lord is this that we're serving? If the real answer he wants is that, oh, we don't trust at all in any of our own righteousness, just believing that he died for our sins. If that's really what he's wanting, why would he tell us this other thing that he wants to see if we fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the ones in prison or, or who were sick? I mean, what kind of twisted person would this be to tell us one thing when really it's the opposite sort of thing that he's actually going to be looking for? And please don't try to skirt around Matthew 25 by saying that Jesus was talking there about governments or countries because it says he's going to gather the nations before him, at least in some translations. The word there that's translated nations in the King James is the Greek word ethnos, which basically means people. It can mean a country or nation in the modern sense, but it just as often means people, or sometimes in particular the Gentile people. But after all, governments or countries don't visit somebody in prison or somebody who's sick. And how could Jesus say to governments, as he says at the end of that passage, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into e eternal life? Do governments, do countries receive eternal punishment or eternal life as countries? It's just another way to try to get around the obvious teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Have any of the passages that we've read tonight contradicted the teaching that we are saved through an obedient, love-faith relationship with Christ? If you're honest, I think you're going to have to acknowledge they all harmonize with it. And please don't think that I've just put together a group of proof texts. I challenge you, read the entire book of Matthew, read the entire book of Luke, read all of the Gospel of John, and see for yourself which model Jesus' teachings fit. His model of being branches on a vine, a living relationship that we can lose, or Luther's doctrine of 
salvation by faith alone. To his teachings fit the popular doctrine of once saved, always saved, or unconditional eternal security. Well, I can assure you what you're going to find is that his teachings fit his own model that he's given us, not the model Martin Luther has given us. Hi, I'm David Berceau, and tonight we're going to be continuing our discussion on harmonizing Paul and James. Last night, we talked about Jesus' illustration of we Christians being branches on his vine. And we talked about that what he teaches in that illustration is that in order for us to be ultimately saved, we have to have an obedient, love-faith relationship with him. We can't say we love him and not obey his commandments because he tells us, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. We also talked about the word believe in Greek and noted that the Greek word for believe is very closely related to the Greek word for obey, that they would think of the two as going somewhat hand in hand. Now let's move beyond Jesus tonight to his disciples. And let me ask you a question. Who were the three primary leaders of the church when it first began? That is, on the day of Pentecost and the first few years after that. I think we would all agree that the three most prominent were Peter, John, and then James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, some people get the impression, and to be honest, it's the impression I grew up with, and I think a lot of us do, that somehow the twelve apostles really never grasped Jesus' teachings. They basically fumbled the ball, so Jesus had to bring in Paul, who got everything straight. And this misconception is amplified by the fact that the book of Acts was written by Paul's companion Luke, We tend to think of it as a history of the church during the first 10 or 20 years of its existence, but that's not at all what it's intended to be. It's a history of God reaching out to the Gentiles. That's the primary purpose of the book. And except for the first few chapters, which do deal with Peter and John and the apostles there in Jerusalem, it's mainly a book about Paul's travels because Luke was the one who traveled with Paul. He didn't travel with Peter or Thomas or some of the others. Also, Paul left us more letters than the other 12 apostles all put together. By 12, I'm including Matthias. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus chose his apostles very carefully, and all of them except Judas faithfully carried out his commission of making disciples of people of all nations— They all went out and spread the gospel. They all founded churches all around the ancient world. And all but the Apostle John died as martyrs, and he suffered as a faithful servant being sentenced to the mines on the island of Patmos. To read more about what the Twelve Apostles actually did, I recommend to you Eusebius' History of the Church, and also the book entitled Search for the Twelve Apostles, both of which are offered by Scroll Publishing. Revelation 21.14 says that the walls of New Jerusalem has 12 foundations and that the 12 foundations have on them the names of the 12 apostles. Jesus built his church on the apostles. They didn't fumble the ball at all. So let's go to the testimony of Peter. He's certainly the one who was the most prominent, who took the lead on the day of Pentecost, the Peter who now has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he is the first one who gives a really clear discussion of how we get on this vine that Jesus talked about. Acts 2, 36-40, Peter says, Therefore let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as by believing, repenting, a change of heart, 
being baptized in a Christian baptism. This is the normal way that we get attached to this vine of Jesus Christ. Again, Acts 10, 34-35, this is Peter. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, that doesn't jive, does it, with Martin Luther's gospel of just believe, just have faith. Peter said, no, there's a reason to fear him. Jesus isn't Santa Claus. He is our Lord, and he does want to see us work righteousness. It's also interesting to note that it was Peter, it wasn't Paul, who Jesus used to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Now, just a few verses after what we just read there in verses 34 through 35, Verse 43 says this, I think it's very interesting. Peter says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. Now, just a moment earlier, he said, everyone who fears him and works righteousness. Now he said, everyone who believes in him. In the Greek language, obey and believe are very closely related. And that's why to Peter, there's no contradiction to one minute say those who work righteousness and the other ones, those who believe, because believe implies that you're going to do whatever that person says whom you believe in. Now, let's go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 17. Peter writes, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm sure that's one of the reasons that Luther approved of 1 Peter, because right there, the first chapter, Peter talks about grace. But let's stop for a moment and discuss that word grace. For most Christians, for most of us, we know it only as a theological word. And Martin Luther is the one primarily responsible for that. But when Peter, Paul, and the other disciples used the word, It was simply a plain, everyday word. Most of the Christians of the first century were illiterate. Paul didn't write to them in elevated Greek with highly technical terms, nor did Peter, who was a former fisherman. They used everyday language that common, ordinary people understood. The Greek word for grace is simply charis, which means favor, loving kindness, goodwill, unmerited kindness. Like I say, it was a fairly ordinary word. We're saved through grace because we're saved through God's kindness that we don't deserve. It's a favor from God. He favors us. His goodwill is shown towards us. But there's nothing in the Greek meaning of charis that disconnects it from obedience or makes it inconsistent with it. God is free to extend charis to whomever he wants. And he chooses ultimately to extend his charis, his grace, to those who abide on Christ's vine in faithful obedience. Now, getting on the vine doesn't necessarily require any obedience. It requires faith and repentance. We become branches on this vine through grace. But again, God doesn't extend this initial grace to just anyone but only to those who have faith and who repent. On the other hand, grace or charis is properly contrasted with wages. If you earn something, then you don't need grace. You're entitled to your pay. It's not a gift. But salvation is always a gift. It's never something we are able to earn. Okay, let's continue with what Peter is saying here. He says, As obedient children... Not conforming yourself to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to what? According to each one's work. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now, again, does that fit Luther's model or does that fit Jesus' model? Well, Jesus said we have to abide on this vine. It's going to involve obedience. There's going to be work that someone can look at. 
I don't mean works trying to earn merit, but works of obedience, works of faith. Again, 1 Peter 4, 17-19. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Again, whose gospel does that fit? The gospel of Jesus or the gospel of Martin Luther? Let's go to 2 Peter, where he writes in chapter 2, verse 15, For if after they escape the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, Second Peter was one of the books that Luther tried to shove into the back closet, saying we just need to read First Peter, not Second Peter. We can turn astray. We can go back to the mud that we used to be in. And if we do that, our end is going to be worse than what it would be if we had never known Christ. Now, that fits exactly what Jesus said about being on this vine that if we don't bear fruit, we're going to be cut off and as a withered branch thrown into the fire. And again, I would encourage you to read all of 1 Peter and all of 2 Peter. And I have some additional quotations on disc 3 that we didn't read just uh, because of the lack of time tonight. Now let's move to the Apostle John, the one who was so close to Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we read, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, grace is in no way inconsistent with Jesus' parable about us being branches on his vine. As we've said, we get on the vine by grace, we stay on it by grace. And in the end, if we still remain on it till the end faithfully, we'll receive God's further grace at the end of that. At no time do we earn it or fully deserve it. But nowhere do the scriptures contrast grace with obedience to Christ. It's always grace versus the law of Moses, as John says there. Now, when we go to the letters of John, well, they sound almost like a repeat of Jesus' words there at the Last Supper. For example, 1 John 2, 3 through 5, John writes, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So how do we know that we're on this vine? It's if we're keeping his commandments. If we're ignoring his commandments, we're kidding ourselves if we think we're abiding on the vine of Jesus Christ. I have to admit, I'm rather surprised that Martin Luther gave his okay to the book of 1 John. But I think the reason is because there's a lot of proof text you can grab out of there, a sentence here, a sentence somewhere else. But when you read the entirety of it, it is such a confirmation of salvation through an obedient love relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, And this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Again, 1 John 5, 1 through 4, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Now Martin Luther would want to stop right there. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Hallelujah. But John continues, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. When we have the grace of God flowing through our veins, inhabiting our soul, 
we find that the yoke of Jesus Christ is easy. It is light, even though it requires human sacrifice at the same time, putting to death our flesh. 2 John 6 says, This is love that we walk according to his commandments. And again, I encourage you to read all three of John's letters. This brings us now to the third prominent leader in the first few years of the church, and that was James, the half-brother of Jesus. Will we find that he's the one who's out of sync with everybody else? Let's see. Go through his book, James 1.12. He says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Does that fit with this obedient love-faith relationship? Does that fit with being on this vine, a branch on it that can be cut off if we're not faithful? Because he doesn't say we've already been approved, that the battle is all over, but when we've been approved, having endured temptation. James 1.22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Reminiscent of what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. How about James 2, verse 12? So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. That's an interesting expression, the law of liberty. Now, at first glance, it might seem that talking about a law of liberty is a self-contradiction, but by no means. Think of the people who came to America seeking liberty, seeking freedom. Now, did they imagine that under this new government, in this new country, there would be no laws? Of course not. They knew there would be laws, but they would be the laws of free people. Well, likewise, we are under laws as Christians. We are under commandments, but they are the laws of a free people, people who've been freed from the bondage of Satan and of sin by Jesus Christ people who are freed of the burden of the Mosaic law. But yes, there are commandments by which we will be judged. The judgment isn't over with for us. James 2.14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And then James 2.20-26, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, what does James mean by works? Well, from the context, it's obvious he means obedience to God's commandments or actions that stem from a living faith. I so often hear commentators say that James is merely saying that if you have genuine faith, it will be demonstrated in your works. Now, if that's what James meant to say, he could have easily said that, couldn't he? He's a very clear writer. He doesn't speak in riddles and abstract thoughts. But the truth is there are a lot of people who have faith that Jesus Christ died for their sins. A lot of people have faith that they have been saved. A lot of people have faith that if they die tonight, they will definitely go to heaven. But a lot of those same people find the commandments of Jesus odious and burdensome. The problem isn't lack of faith, it's lack of love. Back to what Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And as John said, his commandments are not burdensome, if we love him. All right, let's read a few more passages from James. James 5, 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. 
lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. We're still branches on this vine. We can still be cut off. James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Yes, somebody who is on the vine can wander from the truth and end up losing their soul in eternal death. Now let me ask you, is there anything that we've just read there in James that in any way contradicts the teachings of Jesus? Is there one iota of difference between his gospel and that of Christ? Well, no, there is none whatsoever. So we don't in any way have to struggle with how do we harmonize James with Christ. They both say the same things. So half of our task is over. I'm speaking of the task of harmonizing Paul and James. There's nothing we need to change or explain away in James' gospel because he taught the same gospel as Jesus. In fact, James was preaching the gospel of Christ when Paul was still persecuting Christians. At the council in Jerusalem, it was James who presided, not Paul. James fully understood the gospel because Christ had specially appeared to him while he was still on earth in his glorified resurrection body. James taught no different than Peter and John, and as I said, more importantly, he taught no different than Jesus. Now let's move to Paul. Actually, it's unthinkable to imagine that Paul taught a different gospel than Jesus Christ did, or that he taught differently than James and the apostles who were so instrumental in founding the Christian church in its early years. In fact, I want to read to you right now a number of passages from Paul's writings that clearly demonstrate that he, like Peter, James, and John, taught that we are saved by maintaining an obedient love-faith relationship with Jesus Christ. These passages also make it clear that Paul knew of and taught the three different time aspects of salvation, the past, present, and future aspects of it, and that he taught them in the same sense that Jesus laid them out, not in the sense that evangelical theologians lay them out today. Now, I wish that time permitted me to read all of the relevant passages of Paul, but I think that the ones I do read will demonstrate adequately what I've just told you. But I really want to encourage you to read the rest of the passages from Paul, which are set out on disc three. Now, on most of these passages I read, I won't be able to do a lot of discussion on them. And I know sometimes it can be tedious just to hear scripture after scripture after scripture, but I really want you to listen closely. Let the scripture speak for themselves. We're going to start with Romans, Martin Luther's favorite book that supposedly teaches that we're saved by faith alone, that obedience plays no role in our salvation. Somehow Martin Luther must have overlooked the second chapter of Romans, verses 3 through 11, where Paul says, And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things, he's talking about ungodly things, and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace towards everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So did Paul say that 
once we are saved, it's all done. That ungodly living thereafter will not affect our salvation. He said no such thing. Romans 3, 9 through 12. What then? Are we, talking about Jews, better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Now, Martin Luther would have us believe that that passage is saying that even after we come to Christ, we don't do good. Every one of us is still depraved. But Paul just said in the previous chapter that eternal life comes to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory and honor. So in Romans 3, he's talking about the unsaved condition of man, the condition we are all born into, that none of us is righteous. We all need salvation from Jesus Christ. We all have to be a branch on his tree if we're going to be saved. Romans 5, 8 through 10 But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. See, he talks about The past, we have been saved by Christ Jesus, we're on his vine, and through his life, if we maintain the Christ life, if we maintain this communion with Jesus Christ, being on his vine, bearing fruit, then we shall be saved. The future aspect. Romans 8, 1 through 6. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that phrase quoted or seen that phrase in hymns without including the rest of what Paul said, the rest of the sentence, which says, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He continues, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And yet, even though Paul said that, I have seen so many books that talk about carnal Christians that they're still saved even though Christ isn't at the center of their life. No, Paul says to be carnally minded is death. Romans 11, 20 through 23, he says, Well said, because of unbelief, they, the Jews, were broken off, and you, the Gentiles, stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, the Jews, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. I mean, what more perfectly fits exactly what Jesus said in the illustration of the vine and the branches? 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So is it true that there is no one who's righteous? If so, how could Paul say the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That would mean none of us inherit it. Or when Paul quoted from the Old Testament saying "None, there are none who are righteous, is he not talking about the ones who have not been saved in Jesus Christ, that there is nobody who is righteous, who can find salvation through their own goodness? And again, he says, "'Do not be deceived.'" Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 
1 Corinthians 7, 19. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15 through chapter 6, verse 1. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Yes, you can be saved by his grace and yet receive it in vain if you don't abide on the vine. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. You know, how strange. Today I hear so much slogans like this mouthed by self-righteous Christians. If you're 99% sure you're saved, you're 100% lost. Well, Jesus never said anything like that, nor did Paul. Paul says to test yourself. You should be 100% sure that you were saved, that you were born again and put on this vine of Jesus Christ, but then you should be continually testing yourself. Am I still on this vine? Am I still growing and producing fruit? Is Jesus Christ still in me? Or have I become carnal? Paul encourages us to test ourselves, not to be self-righteous. I have it all made. Galatians 5, 19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. The future aspect of salvation is still ahead of us. Ephesians 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Now, does Jesus' illustration of the vine negate that? That we are redeemed through the blood of Christ? That our sins have been forgiven? That we've inherited these riches of grace? By no means. As we have said, nobody can get on this vine of Jesus Christ through his own righteousness. It's through God's grace. And it's because we've been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that saved us. But so many Christians want to just dwell on the past aspect of salvation and not on the present nor on the future. And yes, we need God's grace in the present time, and we will need it in the future because we will have never earned our salvation at any stage of the game. But it doesn't change the fact that Christ requires us to walk obediently to him. Ephesians 5, 5 through 6, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. How many times does Paul have to say that? 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Seems like that is what has happened to today's church, that God has sent this strong delusion that people want to believe the lie. They want to believe they can live without obedience to Jesus Christ, that somehow he can be their savior without being their Lord. 1 Timothy 5.8, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Very similar to what Peter said. How could that be true if it's once saved, always saved? 
2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. No matter what we do, the character of God never changes. But if we deny him, he is going to deny us, Paul tells us. Again, the future aspect of salvation. Well, let me ask you this. Up to this point, has there been any conflict between Paul and James? I think you'd have to acknowledge, no, there there hasn't been. They both teach salvation through an obedient, love-faith relationship with Christ. They both teach that if we don't live obedient, godly lives, once we've been saved, once we are on this vine, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And neither of them deny the fact that God's grace is essential in all three aspects of salvation, past, present, and future. However, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, David, but you haven't read any of the passages of Paul where he says very specifically we're saved by faith and not by works. You've just done the same thing as the people you criticize. You've shoved all those verses in the back closet. No, not at all. We're going to look at those verses now. The verses that Augustine, Luther, and modern evangelical Protestants have made so famous. Now, if promoters of these verses have been using them honestly, then all I can say is we have a real mess on our hands because the gospel they've created from those verses directly contradicts what Jesus himself taught, and it directly contradicts the teachings of Peter, James, and John, as well as all of those passages from Paul that we've just read. But surely the Holy Spirit hasn't given us a bundle of contradictions as the Word of God. So does that mean we need to explain away these other verses? No, never. Explaining away something is never the answer. The answer comes from letting the scriptures explain themselves. Rule number one when interpreting any document is always to pay attention to the context. You never take a statement and separate it from the context in which it was said, not if you're seeking truth. But you see, that's what Martin Luther did. He totally ignored the context of Paul's writings, and thereby he created a whole new gospel that directly contradicts Jesus Christ. And what was the context of most of Paul's letters? Well, he explains at the beginning of his letters what the issues are that he's talking about, and the book of Acts also makes it quite clear of what was going on in the churches at that point. And the issue was that Gentiles were coming to Christ in hordes. They were flocking into the church. But many of the Jews felt that the Gentiles had to be first circumcised and live by the law of Moses in order to be Christians. Well, this put an enormous burden on the Gentiles. And it ignored the fact that Christ had fulfilled the Mosaic law. So this is the context that Paul writes virtually all of his congregational letters in, addressing the question of do Gentiles have to be circumcised and live by the law of Moses? Well, Paul points out that even the Jewish Christians didn't become branches on the vine of Christ because they were faithfully keeping every jot and tittle of the Mosaic law, because they weren't. They were saved through grace by their faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is not an obedient love-faith relationship with Jesus, plus keeping the Mosaic Law. It's simply an obedient love-faith relationship with Jesus Christ. We've been freed from the Mosaic Law with its bondage of endless regulations. Now, last night I mentioned four erroneous methodologies that have led to today's gospel of easy believism and that have created this seeming contradiction between James and Paul. And those four, again, just to remind you, one, relegating the teachings of Jesus to the back closet. Number two is this business of proof texting, of grabbing verses here and there, not paying attention to the context, and not looking at the totality of what the New Testament teaches. Number three, we haven't spoken about very much, and that was turning the New Testament writers into theologians and changing the 
everyday, ordinary words that they were using into specialized theological terms. We talked earlier this evening about the word grace. Two other words I want to mention are justify, which was an ordinary Greek word simply meaning to consider righteous, to attribute righteousness to somebody, and a very similar word, the word to impute, which simply means to consider. When it talks about imputing righteousness, it simply means considering a person to be righteous. And so the terms to justify or to impute righteousness are basically synonyms, nothing theological about them, ordinary terms that you would hear in everyday Greek language of whether you consider someone righteous or you don't. The fourth methodology that we talked about was dishonest Bible translations and reference works. Let me explain a little bit about that. When the first five or six generations of English Christians read the King James Bible, it was immediately obvious to them that Paul was talking about the Mosaic Law. That's because the word law was capitalized, as it properly should be. Now, originally, Greek was written in all capital letters, so a translator has to make a judgment call as to when to capitalize a word in English or when to render it in all small letters. Now, as we're going to see, the context of Paul's letters leave absolutely no doubt that he's not talking about law in general, that is, law with a small l, but he's talking specifically about the law of Moses, and that would be law with a capital L. But if you're using an ordinary King James or a New King James Bible, When you read Romans and the other letters of Paul, you will find that the word law is not capitalized, even when it's clearly referring to the Mosaic Law. That's because the King James Version was, quote, updated in 1769, and in this, quote, update, Dr. Benjamin Blaney took it upon himself to dishonestly alter law with a capital L to law with a lowercase l. Now, on disc three of this set, I've included a picture of Romans chapters two and three from the original 1611 King James Bible so that you can see this dishonest alteration for yourself. Okay, enough of my comments. Now let's listen to what Paul has to say. Romans 3, 20 through 31. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus." whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we established the law. So what is Paul's context when he's talking about justification by works or by faith? It's the Mosaic law. He's trying to establish that even the Jews themselves cannot be saved by the law, let alone trying to force the Gentiles to come under the bondage of the law. Because God will justify both the circumcised and the uncircumcised through faith. And he says, we don't make void the law. 
We establish it. That's what Jesus said. The law isn't going to pass away. It's going to be fulfilled. Romans 4, 1 through 17 This is a passage that we read the first thing last night that on its face would seem to contradict James. Paul says, What should we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin." Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So what is Paul talking about when he says that Abraham was justified by faith and not by works? He's talking specifically about circumcision, that Abraham was declared righteous, considered righteous by God because of his faith. Now, was Abraham's faith just mental assent, he believed in God, the first kind of belief that we talked about last night. No, it was that second kind of believing. He left his home and spent the rest of his life as a nomad, living in tents, traveling to a great distant land, doing all of that in faith, and in faith offering up his son Isaac, or being willing to, as a sacrifice to God. Paul's point is that he was declared righteous before He ever entered into the circumcision covenant with God. Abraham was not originally circumcised. It was something God commanded him to do later after God had already declared him to be righteous. Now, why it's important that we are declared righteous, that we're justified or righteousness is imputed to us, is because none of us, after the fall of Adam, are absolutely righteous. So Paul and James don't contradict each other because they're talking about two entirely different things. Paul is talking about the work of circumcision and to a greater extent to the works of the Mosaic law. But circumcision was his particular issue here. James is talking about works of obedience to Jesus Christ, works of faith, this obedient love-faith relationship with Christ. So we don't have to explain away Paul or explain away James either. Just look at what they're talking about. They're talking about two different things. And see, I think the great sin of Martin Luther is that he turned Paul into a theologian, that Paul is speaking in the abstract, giving a discourse on salvation. And that's how we've all read Paul ever since, because this is how he's presented 
in almost every Bible dictionary, commentary, Bible encyclopedia, sermon, you name it. But Paul was not an abstract theologian. He was a practical man dealing with a practical issue. He was establishing churches or strengthening churches that had already been established by others. And he was witnessing to the Gentiles, and as they came into these churches, they were being told by their Jewish brothers that you all have to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses if you're going to be part of our church. That's why he wrote his letters, not to discuss theology, but to deal with a practical issue that was of great consequence. All right, let me continue reading some of these other often quoted passages from Paul. Romans 10, 1 through 5. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Okay, all throughout Romans, this is his context, the Mosaic law. Now, I go into a lot of this in more detail in the message I recorded last year about imputed righteousness, and I will direct you to that message rather than repeating everything I said there. But when Paul talks here about the Jews trying to establish their own righteousness, he's not talking about people trying to live godly lives on their own strength and therefore are rejected by Jesus Christ. He was talking about the Jews, even after the law had been fulfilled, who were still trying to maintain righteousness before God by keeping the law, and they ended up putting to death God's own son. And then he says, the righteousness of the law, quoting from Moses, is the man who does those things shall live by them. See, that was a salvation by keeping perfectly the law, which nobody did except Jesus Christ. Romans 11, 1 through 6. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Again, is he talking about obedience to Jesus Christ? No. He's talking about the Jews who have been saved. They were not saved through obedience to the law, works of the law. Does Paul have to say works of the law every time he uses that noun throughout this whole letter? Well, when you read the whole letter of Romans, he says it over and over again. He makes it clear he's talking about works of the law. All right, let's move on to his letter to the Galatians. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, he says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So what was the issue? Was it an abstract issue of people trying to be obedient to Christ, people living godly lives when they should have been saying, oh, all my righteousness are filthy rags and I can do nothing good, and therefore just laying back and saying, I'm going to be saved by grace alone, I'm not even going to try to be godly or obedient to Christ. No, he's talking about circumcision again. The ones who were trying to bring the Gentiles into bondage there in Galatia, were Jews. The bondage was being circumcised and living by the law. This is clear in verses 14 through 21 of that same chapter. He says, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, 
Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. There's nothing there to even interpret. Paul is clear what he's talking about, that even the Jews weren't saved by the law. They were saved by grace just like the Gentiles. And now that they are branches on this vine, then, as Paul was able to say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's what every Christian should be able to say. Now, a lot of them say that, but not truthfully so, because it is still their carnal flesh that lives. They have not died to self. They have not died to sin. Galatians 3, 2, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? I mean, I find it outrageous that theologian after theologian can go through Galatians where it is so crystal clear that Paul is talking about the law of Moses and talking about circumcision, and they all play this game of emperor's new clothes. Did you see anything in there about the law of Moses? No, I I didn't see anything. No, he's just talking about law, even when he says it over and over and over again. I'm I'm not going to read any more from Galatians. I have more quotations there uh, on disc three that anybody can see for themselves what the context is. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 17. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, I think we've all heard that quoted, you know, probably thousands of times in our lifetime. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Aha, you might be thinking. Paul does say we're saved by faith alone and not by works. And so obedience to Christ isn't part of salvation. But again, that's not what he's discussing in this passage. He's not writing in the abstract about salvation. He's dealing with the issue of Gentiles being forced to come under the law. Because the very next verse he says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by those or what is called a circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. What is Paul's point? Is that we're not saved by the works of the law that the law has been fulfilled, nailed to the cross. And it was a barrier that separated Jews from Gentiles. And now that wall of separation has been broken down. 
as he said it several times, there is neither Jew nor Greek in Jesus Christ. Okay, what about his letter to the Philippians? Let's read that, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. So what is he talking about having confidence in the flesh? He's talking about circumcision. I honestly believe that a child with a sixth grade education would be able to see this without any difficulty. It's only when the wise and intellectual get hold of it that they turn Paul into something he was not and put words in his mouth that he never said. Colossians. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Again, he's talking about the Mosaic law, and the Jews were judging the Gentiles because they were not keeping the law. Now, I mentioned that not only are Bible translations often dishonest, but so many commentaries, Bible notes, Bible encyclopedias, and dictionaries are. Now, throughout the Middle Ages, Rome often made it very difficult for the common people to ever hear what the Bible really said because they opposed translations made into the common language of the people. Well, Martin Luther, of course, translated the Bible into German, but he did practically the same thing, just not as directly as Rome. He made sure he could color the vision of everyone who would read his Bible by making them see things that aren't even there. I mentioned yesterday that his introduction to the book of Romans is about half as long as the whole book is. In other words, he tells you everything that Paul says before you ever read it. So when you read it, you're going to see something entirely different than what Paul actually did say. Hopefully by now you can clearly see that all of those passages that are so often quoted by the disciples of Luther, that salvation has no relation to works, to, to being a godly Christian, to being obedient to Jesus Christ, are being taken totally out of context, Paul is talking about works of the Mosaic Law. And the law he talks about should have a capital L on it when we translate that. But see, Luther didn't put a capital L on it in his Bible. And he said this in the introduction, so you would hear this before you ever even got to Paul's words. Luther says, Accustom yourself then to this language, and you will find that doing the works of the law and fulfilling the law are two very different things. The work of the law is everything that one does or can do toward keeping the law of his own free will or by his own powers. Now, he's using law with a little l, making it equivalent to the commandments of Jesus. But since under all these works and along with them, there remains in the heart dislike for the law and the compulsion to keep it, these works are all wasted and have no value. This is what St. Paul means in chapter 3 when he says, By the works of the law, no man becomes righteous before God. To fulfill the law, however, is to do its works with pleasure and love, and to live a godly and good life of one's own accord without the compulsion of the law. 
Now, I certainly have no problem in saying that it's not a matter of just keeping Jesus' commandments, and that's why we've described it as an obedient love-faith relationship. If you just go out and, okay, I'm going to try to keep these commandments of Jesus just the same way the Jews tried to keep the commandments of Moses, no, that's that's not going to do it, and you're going to, going to fail. As Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But that's not at all what Paul was even talking about, saying that it's wrong and you're seeking your own righteousness if you try to obey Jesus Christ. Instead, just let it happen. If you have faith, it's just going to come out of you and you will do that. Well, if so, then why didn't that happen? The German people believed Luther, but Germany neither in his day nor any time since has ever been a godly nation. It didn't work. And evangelical Christians say that today, the very same thing. And yet those same people who say, oh, I've, I've been saved apart from works, and therefore now I do things in, in Christ and in the Holy Spirit, why then do they find the teachings of Jesus odious? Why do they object so strenuously to what Jesus said and treat it as though he were giving us commandments that are impossible for humans to live? even with his spirit. So in every one of Paul's congregational epistles, when he talks about works, he is speaking about works of the law of Moses, particularly circumcision. He is not talking about living obediently to Jesus Christ. But now Paul makes a couple of similar statements in his pastoral letters to Titus and Timothy that is similar to the kind of statements he made in his letters to these various churches. And from the context of these two letters, it's not clear if Paul is talking about the Mosaic Law. I assume he is because we have this whole host of other letters, and he says the same thing to each congregation dealing with the same issue. But let me read to you from Titus. Now, Titus 1 does say this, which is probably the setting in which Paul makes his other statement. Let me read to you this. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Now, in chapter 3, he says this, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful." Now, my guess is that when Paul makes the statement that our salvation was not by works of righteousness which we have done, he's talking about the Mosaic Law, but I would by no means be dogmatic about that. The thing to notice is that he's talking in the past tense. He says, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, not through our righteous works. Nobody is attached to this vine of Jesus Christ because of his own righteousness. God saved us, the past aspect of salvation, totally apart 
from not only works of the law, but our own obedience. Again, as we've said, all he requires is that we believe, that we repent of our ungodly life and sins, that we receive the new birth and the washing of regeneration. And this is what causes us to become a branch growing on the vine of Jesus. It's not something that we earned. And we don't earn the future aspect either, but Jesus made it so clear we must obey his commandments if we are going to abide on this vine. Obedience wasn't involved in our being attached to it, but it most certainly is involved in our staying on it. And I think that's the context or thought when Paul writes Timothy, and he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us, past tense, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Again, Paul is talking about the past aspect of salvation. We are saved not according to our works, or none of us would be on this vine of Jesus Christ, but through grace. Well, in closing, I want to remind you that this message isn't finished until you read the scriptures that are contained on disc 3, because I've had to omit so many of them because of time restraints. Now, in my speaking, I've been reading from the New King James Bible, but the scriptures quoted on the disc are, for the most part, in the regular King James, which is actually the 1769 rendition. Now, on disc 3, I've, I have restored the capital L to the word law when it's speaking about the Mosaic Law. Now, also on the disc are these very important passages from the book of Hebrews and from the book of Revelation. Well, I hope after reflecting on all that I've shared over the past two nights, and after you read the third disc, I hope it will be as clear to you as it is to me that salvation is not a one-time event. There are past, present, and future aspects of it. And that the model that best sums up all that the New Testament teaches about salvation is the model that Jesus himself gave us of abiding day in and day out as branches on his vine. It should be obvious that we are truly saved because of God's grace. Yet Christ requires an ongoing, obedient, love-faith relationship with him. We must faithfully maintain this relationship with him throughout the remainder of our life in order to experience the future aspect of salvation, that is, to eventually enter heaven. And God will give us the enabling power to do so if we truly love him with our whole heart, mind, and soul.